50 minutes, we'll focus on airway clearance in the management of airways in the neonatal population. Let's take a look at some of the learning objectives. I'm going to explain some of the indications for airway clearance and techniques in neonates, describe the types of airway clearance techniques, illustrate the equipment used with these techniques, review the hazards and how to address them, evaluate the response to therapy. So if you want to you know, clear the secretions, how do you know? Some of the major things that you would, you know, the clinical findings you would examine in order to say, is this effective? Examine artificial airways in neonates, the actual airways themselves, and furnish you guys with additional resources for those that are so motivated and want to learn more about these topics. So some of the traditional airway clearance techniques, so postural drainage is something that we've mentioned in our other lectures that related to uh, neonates and young pediatric patients. Percussion, and they can be coupled, so you can couple percussion with postural drainage. You have vibration of the chest wall, which can be done manually, but you know, much more commonly today is done through a vest um, or other adjunctive device. We'll focus a little bit on suctioning as well and you know, using appropriate um, suction pressures and size suction catheters and things along those lines. We'll talk a little bit about um, mechanical insufflation and exufflation. So also known um, as a cofflator uh, or in exufflator, in exufflator. And we'll look at some uh, adjunctive medications as well, different uh, substances that can be used to uh, thin secretions um, and help open up the airways to facilitate the process of, of secretion clearance. So you have, you know, I, I certainly believe in, you know, starting with the basics, let's not overcomplicate things. So for individuals that have a uh, sufficient cough effort. So, you know, basically, <clears throat> you know, coughing, deep breathing and coughing, forced expiratory technique, that can even be like a huffing cough, okay? For patients that are in pain or neuromuscular patients, that they have found that we can teach these patients that a huffing cough, not just one blast, but multiple huffing coughs, all right, can be effective also. You can combine both, you know, deep breathing and coughing and that huffing, you know, forced expiratory technique. Positive expiratory pressure, so PEP therapy, there's a, a variety of PEP therapy that's out there the cough assist, autogenic drainage, and then combining some of these can be, uh, you know, can re, uh, result in some great benefits as well. Selecting the patient. So what, do you, you know, what kinds of things you actually do to, to say who's suitable. Um, I, we adopted, uh, you know, so the hospital that I'm affiliated with currently, uh, hospital system, adopted uh, the EPIC electronic health record system about three years ago. And I only bring that up. I'm not, this isn't a sales pitch for Epic. There's certain things I love about it. There's certain things that I'm a little bit less of a fan about, but overall I'm a huge fan of Epic um, and, or, or Epic-like electronic health records because um, there, there's a function called the, the, the summary and it has so much information in such a consolidated manner. So the reason why I bring it up is it can be very helpful for you know, this, that, that page, if you will, the patient summary, it has, chest x-rays on it, you know, so you can actually look at chest x-ray, you know, it has lab value. So you can see if the white blood cell count is going up, you know, and then you can, can combine, they're looking at other lab values as well, but you can combine that with going to um, looking at, you know, just other findings, you know, sputum cultures and sensitivities, going to the notes and seeing, you know, what the nurse and the respiratory therapist has been suctioning, if they've been suctioning the patient, what they've been suctioning out, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it's so it's such a rich source of information and pretty efficient way of actually harvesting that information as well. And when I say kind of at a glance uh, way of doing it. So so in, in you know, the, the veil through which we can look at that is looking at, you know, most places are using electronic health records. If you're not, it's fine. Um, but most most places are. And if you're not, the, the, the idea, the idea is still the same is looking at chest X-rays, you know, is you know, talking when you give report or you're taking report, 
you know, describing the, the, you know, the features of the secretions, the amount, the color, the thickness, the smell, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so looking at, you know, some of the conditions, um, you know, that, that you'd be looking at. So once you look at the clinical findings, really looking at, well, what kinds of conditions would result in excessive secretion? So, you know, in, particularly in this patient population, bronchiolitis being one of them, um, acute low bar atelectasis. So really it's not so much the atelectasis causing it, it's being the result, for instance, of excessive, you know, mucus plugging and that the airways that are distal will, will collapse. Cystic fibrosis, again, this is not a lecture on cystic fibrosis, um, autosomal recessive disorder. Um, you know, again, if mom and dad both need to be carriers, if they're both carriers, then, and, you know, there's a 25% chance that the kid will be, will not be a carrier. There's 25% chance that they'll have, the, uh, 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 rather 25% chance they will not be a carrier, not have the disease. 50% uh, chance they'll be a carrier and 25% chance they're going to actually have the disease itself. Um, sorry for that long-winded explanation, but that's the definition of a, a autosomal recessive disorder. Uh, neuromuscular disease and, you know, and, and, or, and or injury. So the injury part could be, you know, a, a C, C3, a 4, 5 fracture, um, or it could be things, something like muscular dystrophy, which isn't really neuromuscular, it's a muscular disorder, or any one of the, you know, the abundance of spinal muscular atrophy, um, you know, or the other uh, neuromuscular diseases that can absolutely cause not just excessive secretions, less that, but more the inability to clear them. Lung abscess, as you can imagine, that, you know, a pus-filled, you know, pocket in the lung um, could be very pragma uh, pr problematic, asthma, uh, as well. So asthma, the, the secretions tend to be mucoid. So they're not, they're not necessarily purulent. Purulent would be, you know, secretions that uh, are associated with an infection. In asthma, they tend to be, you know, not quite clear, but whitish. They have a lot of viscosity, you know, they have a lot of surface tension and whatever. They can be numerous, but it's really the, more the result of a inflammatory cascade rather than an infectious one. And then really looking at some sample x-rays of, you know, neonates that potentially, again, you know, not just, we wouldn't do this just alone, but potentially, you know, maybe candidates, uh, particularly the one, the, the x-ray that's um, the one that's labeled A and the one that's labeled D. In both cases, that, that left lung is in very, very bad shape. Um, you know, in the, in, you know, in D, the right lung looks, you know, looks reasonably okay. Um, in A, not so much, but there's certainly the right lung looks better than the left. So, you know, you wouldn't make, you wouldn't based on, you wouldn't just say based on an x-ray that the patient actually needs, you know, uh, airway clearance uh, techniques, but other findings, you know, would contribute to that as well. Contraindications, so frank hemoptysis, and we're not just talking about a little, little, you know, the pediat young pediatric patient coughed in there, a little bit of blood, but really talking about frank hemoptysis where, you know, they're really coughing up a lot of blood. And pyema, um, really when thinking about whether you're using, you know, um, you know, PET therapy or manual CPT, you know, you could really, you know, rupture an empyema and then you got, you know, now you have a more widespread uh, pulmonary infection. Foreign body aspiration, untreated pneumo, uh, unstable hemodynamic or overall clinical status as well. CF and bronchiectasis, so really, you know, the, the patients, the, the length that you're actually doing this, um, you're not doing, you're not going in and just clapping on the patient's back for five minutes. Um, that really doesn't do much good for anybody, whether you have CF or not. Um, so you really, you're looking at, you know, a good 15 to 20 minutes. Uh, you know, again, it may be done in sets, um, but for CF and bronchiectasis, you'd be on the longer end of the scale, 30 to 45 minutes. And you know, for any of you who've, who've done CPT manually or using a, you know, a, you know, a, a percussor or something along those lines, is sometimes you go in those rooms, you get a workout, um, even if, again, you're using an adjunctive device. Really needed more than four hours, you know, to, really, really talking about, you know, every four hours. So it's, you know, you know Q1 CPT, you know, they, they would need their own respiratory therapist or nurse. Um, but it's just, you know, to, you know, you might see something every four to six hours, something along those lines. And then the patient should be evaluated every 48 hours and modified as appropriate. So um, again, just to my reference point, we have what's called an assess and treat protocol where we're doing pretty much, if not more frequently, the assess and treat protocol requires us to go back um, every, every other day, at least every 48 hours 
and reassessing the patient for, do they need more? Do they, do they still need the same, you know, do they need less in terms of airway clearance technique? Um, and we, and it also applies to bronchodilator therapy. So we have categories, but in this, you know, the focus of this is airway clearance. So, you know, the standard of care would be at least every, every other day. Therapy modification. So uh, medical, if you have medical and surgical procedures, so you're not gonna do CPT over, you know, a, a surgical incision. Uh, implanted devices, some, some, you know, something that you need to be mindful as well. It's not common to have implanted devices in, in these particular, you know, these young patients, but it's something that you certainly, if they have a graft or something along those lines, or they had, a, you know, recent, recently they, you know, in, implanted, their ba baby was born without, you know, a, a clavicle or something along those lines, and you know, there's consideration for implanting it, something along those lines. Uh, brittle bones, you know, um, again, whether it's result of, you know, malnutrition or some other abnormality, uh, but you'd want to actually, you know, modify it as well. And you think about it, you know, babies by their very definition, they're actually not brittle, but they're small. So they're, they're, their bones are pretty pliable, uh, but they're small. So you just need, would need to be mindful of the amount of pressure that you're applying if you're doing something like CPT. And you, you know, you, you just, being very, doing it very differently than what you would for, you know, an older pediatric or an adult patient. So Trendelenburg, um, you know, you know, today we're not really doing Trendelenburg and CF patients, uh, you know, particularly the real young ones because of the risk for, you know, hemorrhage or aspiration. Uh, but you also have, you know, you know, again, reflux issues, intracranial, um, you know, a trauma, you know, really be careful, you know, in that category as well. Uh, increased intracranial cranial pressure in a patient who maybe has hydrocephalus, something along those lines, um, abdominal distension. And really the, the thing we're thinking about abdominal distension is, well, is it distended and is the patient more apt to vomit? And then they vomit, they're in a Trendelenburg bird position, they're more apt to then, then um, aspirate. Cardiopulmonary failure, it's just the Trendelenburg position is not conducive to oxygenation and ventilation. These are some of the, the, the positions that, you know, you, you can actually, you know, that are actually used. Um, and again, it's just, you know, you, you, just, you think if, if understanding the anatomy goes a long way and understanding, if you're looking at the x-ray and depending upon what, where the cons consolidation of pneumonia exists, you're, you want to put that side up. And if you're combining it with chest physical therapy, applying the chest physical therapy to that particular portion. And you know, the preceding slide was postural drainage. You can obviously, you know, combine postural drainage and percussion, uh, but you have this, you know, this young child here um, who's, you know, being percussed and it's being again combined with with some elements of postural drainage. Chest wall vibration, um, again, commonly used with cystic fibrosis patients. Uh, not, it's not common for, for uh, patients that don't have CF, to, young patients to develop, uh, you know, bronchiectasis, but it happens, you know, it does, it does happen. Um, you know, patients that are uh, born uh, with the alpha uh, trypsin, uh, the, the alpha one antitrypsin uh, deficiency, and it's, you know, they, they can develop emphysema at a, at a young age and, you know, they repeated infections and they, they can develop uh, bronchiectasis, but it's not real common. So, most commonly, the vest would be used for uh, patients that have cystic fibrosis. Uh, cough assist, uh, uh, you know, the inexafflator, uh, you know, cough later, whatever. So the version that, that's shown here is really, it it's a, can be used manually or automatically. There's a, there's a uh, if you will, an iteration that preceded this where the original uh, inexafflator looked like a two-gallon paint can with a kind of a uh, you know, a semicircular um, tube, metal tube on the top. Um, we've, we've thankfully um, gravitated a long way since there. Um, but um, I could tell you that uh, facilities, so, so invented by Emerson in the late 50s, early 60s, it went through a period of time where it was being pretty widely used and then it wasn't being used much at all. And now the cough later has seen somewhat of a resurgence. And a lot of places that weren't using it 10 or 15 years ago are starting to. Um, another category, you know, I mentioned CF patients, but another category of patients that can really benefit both from the vest and from coagulation are your neuromuscular patients. Um, so that's, that's, you know, those, those patients are you know, fairly commonly 
um, you know, will receive, you know, a, a, you know, a, a cofflation uh, therapy um, as part of the regimen. So the cough assist, um, one of my colleagues, uh, he's done a lot of research where it comes to cough assist. And so these, these are what the, what, what, you know, the, the, the guidelines, the respironics now, now, now uh, produces them in Phillips re respironics actually. So they have some basic guidelines that are out there. Um, so one second inspiration, you know, two to three second uh, uh, exhalation or expiration um, for, you know, one to two, one to three uh, IE ratio. Uh, inspiratory pressure max of you know 20 to 25 centimeters. Expiratory pressure max of 20 to 35. Um, um, again, a few of my colleagues have said you know if you use less than 20, you're wasting your time. Um, 25 may not be enough on the inspiratory side of the equation, even though the manufacturer says that's the recommended. Um, so I'm not I'm not personally recommending it, but I'm saying that there have been higher inspiratory pressures that have been used, not limitlessly higher. But you know, 35, 35, something along those lines, um, with you know little to no uh, adverse effects. And then you know you think about sets, so five to ten cycles over five to ten minutes. And you're probably combining this with other things as well, perhaps you know things like CPT. So the whole regimen may be you know, a 20 minute regimen, uh, again for a non CF patient. Uh, monitor of contraindications and of course adverse events. All right, now let's look at suctioning. So we'll go a little bit more old, old school. Um, I, I still teach uh, respiratory students, so I don't mean to condescend, but these questions still come up on the credentialing exam. So, um, and it's good. I, you know, I don't typically work in a, a neonatal environment, so it's, it's good to review this sort, this sort of stuff as well. But for neonates, the vacuum pressure would be um, less than 80. They say, you know, typically you need about 50 to 60 to actually get the secretions out. So that's where that guideline comes from. But certainly for neonates, keeping it less than 80, for children, keeping it less than 100. And then if you recall for adults, you can go to 100 to 120. Um, you know, so it is a little bit variable. And the main reason for that is just, you know, minimizing your chances. There's less volume that's in the lung. So you're, you're, you're actually sucking less of the breath out of the patient. Um, and you're also applying less, the, the tissue is more sensitive and you're applying less, if you will, pressure to that, uh, negative pressure to that tissue, you know, less likely of, likelihood of causing tissue damage. Appropriate length and size of the catheter. So, you know, it shouldn't exceed, uh, you know, half the, the inside, interior diameter of the artificial airway. And then a little bit more guidance for neonates, you know, five to eight French for pediatrics, depending upon the size of the pediatric patient, up to 12 French. Um, Installation of saline or other medication is a bit controversial um, for a lot of reasons, particularly if they have an artificial airway, you could be washing the biofilm down into the lungs. So that biofilm is the, the film that, you know, the, the, the mucus film that builds up on the inside of the artificial airway. Um, and it is not necessarily, the microbes that build up is, are not necessarily the same ones that are in the, in the lungs. The uh, nasal, uh, nasal tracheal suctioning, and you know another another um, way of actually one, you know you can go through an artificial airway or you can go through the nose if you will. Bulb suction for your for your neonates are commonly used. Um, closed suction uh, uh, tracheal suction systems for patients that have artificial airways, tracheostomies, or ET tubes. Suction uh, uh, suction catheter sizes. So giving you a little bit of guidance where you're talking about the actual, you know, correlating into the size of the artificial airway and giving, you know, some guidance along those lines. So you can see, you know, just a couple of examples, you know, for a number four um, ET tube, um, the suction catheter size would be, um, you know, eight. Uh, going up to 5.5, you, you can go, you can go up to 10. To instill, um, or you know, saline or not, I mentioned the controversy. I, this slide here talks a little bit about it. So saline installation prior to suctioning remains controversial. Um, the catheter insertion alone may dislodge thousands of, of bacterial uh, particles into the lung. Uh, a flush of saline increases this and potentially distributes it, you know, basically spreads it around. When necessary, low sodium uh, a solution may preserve the antimicrobial component of the airway mucus. You remember, you know, you got the sol and the gel level layer. Um, so the 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 mucus is there for a reason. Uh, so it's 
it's our friend and it's our enemy. If it's excessive and it gets it consolidates, consolidates an airway, it blocks an airway, it results in plugging, it's a problem, but it's also protective. It, it helps remove debris and also provides it's kind of bacteriostatic where it, it, you know, it's an environment where bacteria does not like to grow in general, in general. Um, what can happen is, you know, if you're using normal saline, um, it can disrupt that because you're removing, the, you know, the mucus, but it can disrupt it. And therefore a recommendation may be to use actually, you know, half normal saline, you know, half strength, if you will, normal saline. It has less of a, less of a tendency to, uh, if you will, dilute the antimicrobial pro, uh, 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 if you will, um, properties of the mucosa. And then some, some other agents that you'll, you'll see. So on the bottom here, I'm doing this in reverse here, you, hypertonic saline. Um, so 7% would be really often reserved for CF patients, 3%. Um, the good news is, again, bad news is it can, again, uh, con contribute to or, or dilute the, the uh, bacteriostatic properties of mucus. Um, that's, uh, on the, that's on the negative side. The, the, on the good side, it will actually cause uh, fluid to be drawn out of the mucosa into the mucus and will help thin it out. It's also very inexpensive uh, versus, versus uh, Dornase Alpha. Uh, so Palmazion is expensive. Uh, if you think back when you learned about the anatomy and physiology of mucus, yuck, right? Um, so, we, so you have a, a you have a um, you know you, you have your disulfide bonds. So if it's, it looks a little like a centipede. So a molecule of mucus looks like a, a kind of a centipede. Um, it has uh, a backbone that's actually a protein backbone. And I will tell you, pulmazine works on the protein spine, literally the, the, the backbone. Whereas a mucus works on, if you will, the centipede legs, where the di, the, the disulfide bonds exist. Um, and again, um, mucus used to also be very cheap. It was so cheap that a lot of play, a lot of, of, of pharmaceutical companies ceased making it, um, and then it became hard to get and got more more expensive. It's not as expensive as Palmazine. Cost matters. Um, we have a, a clinical uh, a pharmacist who rounds with us, and we, we discuss these at bedside when we do interprofessional rounds. And you know, the option of using any one of these, we typically don't use. You know, Palmazine is pretty much reserved for CF patients and patients that have. Um, you know, uh, other, you know, diseases where, you know, odd, oddball diseases where the secretion, nothing else works, uh, quite frankly, it's expensive. Mucamis, you know, fairly commonly used, but the studies basically say, you know, acetylcysteine slash mucamis, hypertonic are relatively quote, equivalent in, in efficacy. Complications of airway clearance. So hypoxemia is probably one of the most common, it's transient. So you may have to apply, you know, particularly if you're coupling it with like a head down position, you know, with Trindellenburg position, or you're coupling it with, um, you know, some, some um, you know, other, uh, you know, the patient's in an oddball position where they can't breathe as well. Um, you know, so transient hypoxemia is treated by delivering oxygen. Uh, airway obstruction, respiratory rest, so, you know, the, the good news is they're getting the secretions out. The bad news is they're in the process of getting them out and they, they may, this, you know, dislodge a, uh, a mucus plug that lodges elsewhere and causes a, a airway uh, obstruction. In the little patients, it can be really problematic because, you know, if, if enough of their airway gets obstructed, it can result in, in, in respiratory arrest and, and it could res result in cardiorespiratory arrest. And the problem there is our real young patients don't have any reserve. So they will become compromised much faster than our older pediatric and adult patients. In a cranial, uh, complications, just again, fr fragility of their, their, uh, their, the vessels in their brains, big issue, rib fractures and bruising. It, that's really for the young patients, but perhaps ones that are malnourished and do have brittle bo bones, uh, but also ones that the pediatric patients that, uh, that have CF and we're doing repeated CPT to, it may be bruising less than fractures, but they can get very, very sore from the repeated chest physical therapy. Uh, airway trauma, just you know, from the actual suctioning, and infection is a risk of you know virtually everything that we uh, that we do. Evaluation: Did the therapy work? The amount of secretions, uh, you know, expectorated um, can you know, if they're expectorated, or the amount of secretions that are actually suctioned out. Um, you know, so hydration status. The reason I put that here is, you know, hydration status is something that um, if 
the patient is dehydrated, the secretions will, will become thicker with all else constant, okay? However, if they're adequately hydrated, hydrating them more is not gonna thin the secretions out more. It's just avoiding a, if you will, a dehydration state is really, really critical. Um, you know, so if there's, if there's secretions are thick, you need to then go back and say, is the patient adequately hydrated? That's why it's in this evaluation here. And, and you know, if their eyes and O's, it, it, you know, if they've been putting out much more fluid than they've been getting in and their secretions are thick, it may just be that they need, you know, better hydration. Changes in speed and production, you know, the color more or less, you know, it could be in the right direction. It could be that they, they don't need CPT anymore because they're, they have many fewer secretions, their x-rays looking better, their oxygenation is better, et cetera. And then breast sounds, vital signs, you know, chest x-rays, we're typically not just, you know, doing blood serial blood gases for the sake of doing serial blood gases, but if they're being done, they may be reflected in, in terms of improvement as well. Lung mechanics, mainly in terms of um, the, you know, the, the compliance and the resistance. Documentation of therapy, you know, the technique used, these are the things that, you know, you would document, whether it's a manual or electronic health record, you know, what technique or techniques were used, how long they were done, you know, what, what physiologic locations or lobes that were treated, position of the patient, suctioning, et cetera, amount and quality of sputum. And then what I didn't put here, but it was really critical, it's, you know, how well they, they tolerated it, um, really, really crucial. So now we're going to just, uh, you know, flip to the related topic in this presentation of airway management. Well, let's take a look in, in this patient population. So, you know, some of the, the, the need for in, intubation um, in, a, in a younger patients, they overlap with, you know, with our, you know, our older patients as well, our adult patients. So indications, lack of pulmonary function, um, you know, deficits in oxygenation, ventilation, you know, uh, a PACO2 greater than 50 to 60. Uh, PaO2 of less than 60, sometimes you'll tolerate even 55. Um, the saying is 55 keeps them alive, but things that, that you know that you would look, look for. Um, and then, you know, then some of the actual uh, equipment, you know, the actual ET tube itself at the age specific ET tube, the age specific laryngoscope and, the, and blades, laryngeal mask airway as an alternative suction equipment, oxygenation equipment, you know, we can adequately bag valve mask the patient and bag them up uh, and to you know, prepare them for the, the actual, uh, the fact that we're gonna be suctioning them and really suctioning the breath out of them for a period of time. And then um, just, the, the, this is, the, there's a lot on this slide, but the, that's the bad news. The good news is that there's a lot on this slide. So you can really get, it gives you a kind of an idea of you know, what you'd actually do in terms of the size of the airway notice kind of, uh, you just go kind of in the middle bottom of, of, of this slide, where you look at about five, six years old, and you're seeing now we, where you actually have, you know, ranging from, you know, a 4.5 cuffed, uncuffed. So you get an idea at about what threshold that, the, you know, the, the, where there, there's an option for, for, for cuffed and uncuffed, okay? And it's in that, you know, two to six, year old range, and then your tubes that are, you know, in that four to five range, and then pretty much when you get north of 5.5, they're all, um, they're all cuffed, you know, so, so no, no surprise there you get, you know, and again, there could be a, you know, a, a 12 year old who's failure to thrive. And, you know, so, you know, they could, they could have the body habitus of a, of a two year old. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about a typical two, six, 10, 12 year old or adolescent. Um, and it gives you some, you know, idea, you know, on securing the tube. Now, securing the tube, this is, this is basically would be a starting point. Obviously, you, your patient, you know, moving as we move towards the right portion of this slide, um, just to give you guidance, you're going to get, it, the team is going to get a chest x-ray and you're going to evaluate the depth of the tube and we'll have to reposition it, you know, patients tall or short or just their, they may be neither, they may be an average height, but that their airway the, 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 if you will, the distance between their lip and, you know, uh, uh, their carina is maybe long. It's just, it's just them type of deal. Um, and then all the way over on the right-hand side is giving you some additional guidance on the, the size suction catheter that you could use as well with that. So a lot of inf information on the slides. It's kind of one of those ones that, you know, you just slip in your, in your hip pocket if you found yourself working in 
the um, particularly in the pediatric, because you're covering a good spectrum of pediatric patients is uh, ages as well here. And it's showing you kind of you know one of the neo bars or one of the, the pieces of equipment that's used to secure the ET tube. Um, you know, there's a lot of different um, securing devices that are out there. The big, uh, the, you know, the big issue is that you want to, you know, babies have very sensitive skin. So it's, it's the positioning of the ET tube, okay, so that you really want to move periodically so you don't get skin break down there, but also where it's actually secured to the baby's cheeks, you're really going to inspect that periodically to make sure that the baby's not getting break down there as well. For extubation, so, you know, and again, very short list here, but looking at some of the considerations for extubation, you know, um, our default is um, in, in all of our uh, uh, units, again, of various ages, so our, our NICU or our PICU in our adult ICUs is patients should be, you know, weaning unless they prove otherwise. Um, you know, and, and again, for your neonatal patient, it may be that they're just, their, their oxygen index, their P to F ratio is just crappy. Their x-ray is crappy. So, okay, then right? that's documented that patient is not weaned because, you know, they're still on, you know, uh, high PEEP, they're, they're, you know, they're on an oscillator, or they're a potential candidate for ECMO, whatever the case may be. But that's, you know, at, at some point, the patient is either going to get worse or they're going to get better. And they, they get worse, they may die. And I don't say that insensitively, but a lot, thankfully, a lot of these patients will eventually, the sickest ones will eventually get better because we have a lot of tools in our tool chest. And, you know, we're, we're going over the, some of them in this lecture and other related lectures. Um, condition has improved or been re reversed. Patients hemodynamically stable. They're starting to breathe spontaneously so we can transition them from the ventilator to let's say a bubble CPAP um, or a high flow nasal cannula. The patient is able to protect their airway. You know, it's really critical. They may have great values, they may, they may, they may, but it may be a simple issue with they're at very high risk for aspiration. You see that with some of your neuromuscular patients as well. Tracheostomy, so looking at the indications, so, you know, airway obstruction, airway protection. So the patient may have been intubated. They have a neuromuscular disorder. They're not a candidate for extubation anytime soon, and then and trach may be the best way to go. So airway obstruction, airway protection, long-term ventilation, again, for some of your neuromuscular patients, uh, pulmonary hygiene, so basically able to better, um, uh, some of the patients will actually wean better uh, because if you think, think about it, the length of an ET tube is as long as it is. The an average tracheostomy tube is about a third the length of an ET tube. And the whole issue of the additional resistance that's imposed on the patient by an artificial airway is a function of the internal diameter or circumference for the internal opening and the length and the length. A little more on tracheostomy. So the different tubes, by the way, there are many, many, many different types of tubes. I was I was with the respiratory students earlier today and we, we were discussing more than a handful, but I, the point I was making is when we're talking about fenestrated tubes, which I'm not gonna die, take a deep, deep dive into now, um, but, but um, you know, and I, we were talking about, but I basically said to them, there's a lot of different types that are out there. So just to focus on a few of them, you know, the high volume, low pressure is really kind of the standard of care today, high volume, low pressure. So the, the chances of that, of a, when, when, when the, the, in this case, the trach is cuffed, because we can be uncuffed, you know, not to facilitate mechanical ventilation, but to, to facilitate airway patency. Um, but when it's actually cuffed, it's uh, the default is it's air filled, it's high volume, it's low pressure. And that the, the so it's low pressure, um, the pressure it exerts on the trachea is minimal, so that therefore the chance of developing tracheal malaysia, tracheal stenosis is, is reduced. Foam cuffs uh, can be used as well. And again, if you recall, foam cuffs, you're actually, the, the, the reason why they have a, if you will, a pilot balloon set up is not so much to, you're basically taking the air out of the cuff, okay? You're using that to take it out, not adding any, anything because it's relaxed state of a foam cuff is, in, if you will, inflated or expanded, if you will. Um, and again, just for the newbies, you know, that, that, that we, get, we get odd traits uh, here and about. And you sometimes you just have to really look very carefully and, you know, and indeed look up the manufacturer specifications, et cetera. Um, TTS tight to shaft. So the, in the bottom right of this slide, it almost looks like a cuffless uh, trach. It's actually not. You could see that because it has a, it does have a pilot balloon, but it's, it's a silicone cuff. Um, it adheres very tightly to the shaft and uh, can be used for a lot of purposes, but it's actually used um, mainly for, um, for adult 
pediatric or neonatal patients that, if you will, um, have a small stoma. There's stoma issues because they tend to be much easier to insert and to maintain. Some of the complications, you know, that exist. So, you know, again, lo looking at, um, you know, preventing so good training for caregivers, so preventing the complications, the infection, the mucus plugging, etc. Um, and again, looking at, you know, plugging of the tube. So, you know, the cure for that, there are uh, there are trach tubes out there that don't have an inner cannula. They're just a single cannula. Okay which makes me really twitchy because if, if there is a, you know, uh, um, if the, if, if the patient's high pressure, okay, they're on a ventilator, they have a trach, you're high pressure and you're, you know, it's, it, you've eliminated all the obvious stuff and it's not a pneumothorax, um, but you try to advance a suction catheter and it's una unable to advance. You could always take out the inner cannula and replace it. Okay. Um, you know, hence the importance of having an extra, at least one inner cannula at the, at the bedside. Um, so that's, you know, again, complications, the plugging of the tube, some of the things that you'd actually do. Accidental dislodgement, so ac accidental, the, you know, that the, the, the patient is decannulated. Um, let's say that they were moved and the vent circuit stayed and, you know, and, and, you know or they were, um, you know, they were fidgeting with it or they became, you know, uh, very stimulated or startled and they pulled on the tube and actually de decannulated themselves. Other uh, complications, you know, bleeding, stomal and superstructure granulation tissue. So sometimes the actual stoma needs to be what's called revised, revised, where that, that, that um, scar tissue and granulation tissue needs to be removed um, either with a scalpel, uh, other surgical device, or sometimes it's actually cauterized. They actually do it with, with a, a, a electrical quarter. Um, Supersternal uh, tracheal malaysia. Um, so, you know, really that what I was alluding to before, where the trach itself becomes softened over a period of time because the cuff has been, you know, if you will, impeding uh, both arterial venous flow as well as lymphatic flow. Speech delay and delay in phonation. So, one of the, one of the things that can help with that in the, your younger patients is using a passing ear valve um, and different. Types of swallowing, swallowing complications can exist as well. Decannulation. So, so now we're talking about intentional decannulation. So you think about some of the indications for extubation. Well, you know, these, these are somewhat similar. The original condition has been resolved or improved. Natural airway is adequate. The, the patient can protect their airway. Um, the procedures, generally speaking, it's downsizing and, and cap the tube. Um, so immediately remove the tube. You know, it's done in, you know, um, in different lectures, we talk about the pluses and minuses of different techniques, but, you know, you know, immediately removing the tube without downsizing it may not be the best way to go. Um, also, you remove the tube, you, just, you, you potentially lost your airway if the patient needs to be, you know, if they go into respiratory compromise, you know, soon thereafter. Um, downsizing and capping the tube is often the way it's done, extubate after single stage laryngeal tracheal um, uh, reconstruction. So really, you know, just basically, um, you know, either the sink or swim or the gradual is really what we're looking at here. Some, some take home points. Um, airway clearance techniques can be beneficial to neonates, pediatric patients, and obviously adults. Adults are not the focus of today's lecture, but, you know, it certainly can be helpful. There are many, many techniques which, uh, which can be applied. So you have this arsenal. And, and you know, the good news is, that you know the, the the techniques that can be applied um, get, can be combined with one another. So things like postural drainage, you know, CPT, um, you know, can be applied with mucus thinning um, medications such as uh, hypertonic saline, things along those lines. Um, however, you know, keep in mind that if if the if your drug of choice uh, for mucus thinning is a uh, mucomus or acetylcysteine, you really should also recommend that a, a, a beta adrenergic bronchodilator be, you know, be combined with that. Uh, that. That substance can be a bit caustic and can cause um, a bronco, um, bronchoconstriction. Selecting the best technique should be tailored to the patient and their condition. So it really often it's techniques, it's not a technique, but it really needs to be you know, looked at the you know, the pluses and the minuses like we do with our own personal lives, as well as in treating our patients or, you know, patients that have all different diseases of all different ages. 
you look at your, what are your choices? What are the pluses and minuses? And what, what's the best way to go? What does the evidence, you know, what are the guidelines and evidence actually say? Most airway clearance techniques have hazards, like most of the things that we do have hazards, um, which can be, uh, you know, addressed by the skilled clinician or the skilled team. Careful assessment is the foundation for evaluating the need for the therapy as well as its effectiveness. So just like you know, evaluating, and again, I, it's, it bears mentioning again, and that is that um, you know, having protocols to assess patients' needs for bronchodilators, for airway clearance, um, for you know, non-invasive uh, therapies, for oxygen titration, you know, the entire ensemble is really, really critical. That way you're uh, you know, eliminating or minimizing unnecessary therapy so that uh, the time that's spent, the time that's spent is, you know, if you will, higher, higher dividend or higher value activities. And lastly, artificial airways should be suitable for the patient, properly maintained and removed as soon as practical and safe. Some references here, again, I went back to Walsh's, um, but he's also, so I've listed one of uh, Brian Walsh's uh, textbooks, but I also, you know, he also does um, a lot of the original research. Um, and again, one of them I listed here is a really, really good piece. Um, you know, 2011, it's a little bit dated, but it, it, it's an outstanding piece and really talks about pedi pediatric airway maintenance and clearance in the acute care setting, how to stay out of trouble. Excellent, excellent piece. And then you have, you know, your, your textbooks that are out there, um, as well as your sources, uh, your, if you will, your databases, uh, PubMed, Medline, AARC, uh, for, if there's any nurses in the audience, the AARC is the American Association for Respiratory Care, um, and they have clinical practice guidelines, and those clinical practice guidelines are based on a lot of the original research that's in uh, sources such as PubMed and Medline. 